coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. It needs to have that trailing hook. I really like that. It needs to push water um, to let its presence be known to the fish. Um, and so a, a fairly decent head on it, something that pushes water. Um, it has to have fine dark markings. Um, and then it has also has to have movement. It has to have movement and, and as many types of movement as you can. And so for instance, like to get both barring and movement into the fly. That was Tim Flagler on the four things every swung fly must have. Trout spay finding fish and quite possibly the greatest fly tying YouTuber on the planet. Today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We are still looking for a few spots to fill the Stillwater School. It's open right now if you go to wetflyswing.com slash trips, T-R-I-P-S. You can learn more and find out uh, what we have going there and get a shot at heading up to the Northern Lights Lodge for some Stillwater goodness with Phil Roy. Today's episode is sponsored by Dalton at uh, Country Financial, who thrives on helping families and community members through the power of education and proper insurance coverage. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can check out Dalton right now at wetflyswing.com slash country and make sure you are protected today. Today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest Euro nymphing reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without shoulder burn. Check out Maverick Fly Fishing Stinger and their other Euro nymph products and support this podcast by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash maverick right now. That's maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick. Check out the lightest and most unique Euro nymphing reel right now. Tim Flagler is back on the show to break out some of his magic with a focus around trout spay. We find out which lines and uh, and which rods are best, how he presents the fly and the location uh, where he presents that fly to fish. And of course, we talk about fly tying and some of his top flies. Like I said earlier, it doesn't get much bigger than this. Trout spay, Tim Flagler, tightlinesproduction.com. Here we go. How you doing, Tim? I'm doing really well, Dave. A little busy, a little haggard with show season, but uh, other than that, not too bad. I love it. Yeah, I haven't been out as much as last year. I feel like I'm getting a break a little bit. I mean, I love the shows too, but remind us again, I know you're doing all the show circuits. What's your favorite thing about the show scene? A lot of it is just meeting old friends. I, I got to be completely honest. Both industry people, as well as people that, you know, who just stop by and say hello and you know, uh, people that watch my YouTube channel and it's just nice to get to meet them in person, you know, yeah. correspond online and everything like that. But, um, just to see them in person and chat with them and, uh, especially people that, you know, I've met at the shows year after year and, uh, it's really cool to, to get to interact with them in person. Yeah. And at this point you probably know, I mean, you've been doing this a while. Do you feel like you kind of know everybody out there or there are still a lot of new faces? <laughs> It's still new faces, but it's, um, this is going to sound terrible. I'm not getting any younger and, um, it's so many faces and I, I'm pretty good at recognizing faces, you know, and, um, names, <laughs> names, I've got to admit a little dodgy on the names. And th then we have some people that do crossover between different shows. And so like, you know, I know them from Denver, Pleasanton, California, and they show up at the Atlanta show. And it, it just really confuses me sometimes. Like, what? what? I thought, you know, you know, that kind of deal. Oh, yeah. But it's all good, and, and they're all very good about it. It's not like they're upset that I can't come up with a name or anything. Yeah, totally. Awesome. So you got a couple more. We're kind of coming in here in uh, February, so you got a couple more shows right there on the West West Coast. Yeah, well, and then back east. So I'm going to be doing um, Denver and then Pleasanton, California. And then we're back here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, which is always a fun show, kind of the close of the, you know, the big fly fishing shows, the Ferimskis. And then we do one more in uh, uh, north of Detroit, the Midwest show, which is a, a, a great, uh, really nice show for me to round out the season on. And, and uh, a lot of good people and 
a uh, lot of variety at that show. You know, you're kind of getting traveling saltwater guys, Great Lakes guys, you know, driftless guys, and uh, some uh, steelheaders in there as well. So some two-handed stuff. And yeah, I, I like the variety at the shows. Remind us again, where are you at? Where do you guys live? We're in northwestern New Jersey, kind of out in the middle of nowhere in New Jersey and have a, a beautiful trout stream that blows right through the center of town, the south branch of the Raritan River. And uh, in fact, that's actually fishing pretty well right now. Yeah, I heard uh, it's been pretty mild winter so far. Is that the case out in New Jersey? Yeah, we had um, one real big cold snap last week. Fortunately, Joan and I were down in Atlanta, so so we missed it. Um, but yeah, single digits, and then it bounced right back up, and um, ice is out of the rivers, and actually the trout spay bite afternoon has just been fabulous, um, as well as some midge hatches, you know, sporadic midge hatches throughout the day. We're very lucky here. Where, where I'm in New Jersey, we can pretty much – fish year round the only months that get a little dodgy or summertime when it just gets too warm and so we stop fishing but the trout do hold over so it's good yeah we were up there in december and it was a pretty mild trip we hit uh, ohio for steelhead with jeff liskay and, and it was a really cool uh experience oh, very good yeah i hadn't been fished that whole lake erie it was really amazing so we're excited yeah. to get back. We're even thinking like maybe we'll do like a tour of a few states, maybe start in New York and kind of work our way across something like that. Oh, yeah. You could work your your way around from like Salmon River on Ontario and then, then go all the way around through the Rochester stuff and over to Buffalo and then, wow, that would be a great trip, Dave. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we're working on. So we'll see how it comes together. It's one of those things, you know, you have limited time, but it is a good part of the country. So, um, so I just look in here, it was episode 279. We're in the 400s now, and we're doing a lot wow. of more contests. It was only a year ago that we chatted. It seems like since it was back in 279, that was a long time ago, but we've done quite a few episodes since then. So, Jeez, yeah, been busy. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be awesome to catch up with you because we're going to talk Trout Spay today. I mean, you obviously, I think, made your name. You know, Everybody knows you for sure from Tight Lines Productions, all the fly tying you've done. We talked about that in the last episode. Uh, but yep. today we're going to dig into Trout Spay, which is another challenge for some people, a lot of people really, because I think even to the definition, sometimes you say trout spay and people are like, well, you know, what do you mean exactly? What is trout spay? So right. maybe we could start there. Like, cause I know you have a program where you cover this. Let's just walk people through this. Like start just on trout spay. Is there like a definition or is it pretty broad? It's pretty broad. And it, what it really refers to are lightweight spay rods. Rods that pretty much weren't in existence until about 15 years ago. I mean, you had larger, say, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weight um, spay rods that were used for Atlantic salmon or steelhead, um, you know, larger species, larger rivers. And and then what people began to figure out was that you could just downsize that gear a little bit, apply the same casting techniques, and just make the, the gear more suitable for trout. So I think there may be a one weight trout spay out there. I'm not, no, I wow. don't, don't to that but i know i know because i have one um they're a bunch of two three four uh weight and i think you can consider trout spay gear going up to about a five weight and it's a little misleading because those rods are they say you can actually add three line weights to them so a two weight is effectively a five weight you know in a normal overhead say nine foot five weight rod overhead casting rod and so it can handle you know a fairly large fish even on a two weight you get up to a five weight, you know, akin to an eight weight, you know, normal overhead casting weight forward fly line rod. Um, and, you know, rods range anywhere from from really as short as about 10 feet, you know, all the way up to 13.6, I guess, would be about the biggest trout spay rod I've heard of. And um, it's super fun stuff. It, it really is. And I actually see in the, the coming years, maybe things like one weight and zero weight trout spay rods, you know, kind of teeny. But still with line setups, um, whether they're Skagit heads or Scandi heads that allow you to do these spay type casts and uh, just on smaller and smaller water. Right. And with trout spay, do you think most people think of, you know, when you hear trout spay, because you could kind of say like single hand spay too, but is it more synonymous with like two handed rods or is it kind of overlap? There's kind of an overlap there. And the way I got into it, it's it's really kind of a backwards way, um, but it does involve the single hand spay. I, I mean, a lot of people I think might go, 
to get into Spain in general, they may say take a trip to Alaska or to the Canadian Maritimes. And, you know, the guide there is using a two handed rod, say a, you know, a seven weight or an eight weight, you know, something around 13, six. Um, and so they, they try it out and they go, wow, that's pretty cool. They get home to their local waters and go, Hey, there's this, you know, they hear about this new thing, trout spay and get into it that way. For me, I was really trying to solve one problem and one problem only, and it was night fishing. And, uh, we got some great night fishing here in New Jersey. And if you're ever going to have problems night fishing, it's going to be on your back cast. If you're o- overhead casting and, yep. uh, you know, a lot of times where I am, the trout want to get out of the deep water and get into the shallower water to feed at night. And if you're wading out in the river to get your back cast clear of, uh, you know, whether it's a steep hillside or overhanging trees, that's not good because, First of all, you're waiting in the river in the middle of the night. Secondly, you're spooking trout that want to be there. So I, I don't know whether it was a mistake or <laughs> <laughs> I uh, went to the uh, OPST, Olympic Peninsula Skagit Tactics website, and started watching some of their videos on YouTube. And um, gosh, if you don't have a second mortgage application, <laughs> and, uh, don't, don't go to that site because it's it's a such a deep, dark, wonderful hole. Um, and so I just started, I got one of their commando heads, put it on my regular nine foot five weight uh, rod, you know, that I normally drive fly fish and nymph with and everything. I got a spare spool and just changed it out. And I, you know, was, I could fire casts all the way across all the water here in New Jersey with no problem at all and no back cast and started adding different tips to that head. Um, you, you can go anywhere from floating to intermediate to, you know, three inches per second, five, seven inches per second, and then into, you know, the T10 and T14 and all these, you know, things that are really going to get it down deep. But they say once you start doing that, it's called being spay curious. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you watch a few more videos and they're, they're guys casting these two-handed rods and you just go, wow, those casts look even cooler with a two-handed rod than they do when you're doing it single-handed. And it's almost a given. Seriously, if, if you take up the single-hand trout spay stuff, I don't know how you would avoid uh, in the future not getting a two-handed rod. It's super, super fun. And the fact of the matter is the casting, even the single hand stuff, really, it changed my approach to overhead casting as well. I'm using some of those um, spay techniques, um, sort of spay casts when I'm just regular fishing, you know, with a weight forward line and on my, say my nine foot five weight and uh, something like a snap T enables you to relocate your cast back upstream if you're, say, streamer fishing, uh, just with a single move, as opposed to doing that overhead casting kind of lawn sprinkler deal, where you're work where you're working your way upstream, and it's just it's a very very quick and efficient way to get back upstream. So yeah, I came to Trout Spay very very differently than most people would, and I'm glad I did. It, you know. There, there's a lot of different things you can do uh, fly fishing aside from just say the normal overhead casting five and four weight rods. You know, there's there's Euro nymphing and there's Tenkara and and this is another one that is especially fun. And um, you know, there's so much to do uh, with it. Not just trout spay kind of gets you into. Uh, I, I started using uh, spay gear in the surf here on the Jersey Shore. Oh wow. Yeah. And so you bump up there and you, you figure out, well, you know, I, I got that, that three or four weight trout spay, but man, a, a seven weight <laughs> switch rod would be about perfect for the surf. And, um, and then you do that and then you, you know, you start looking at, you like, got it all, you got it all covered. Yeah, <laughs> I then, find myself, yeah, you're probably on the, and then you turn around, you've got like as many spay rods as you have single hand <laughs> rods. Is that kind of how it looks? Yeah. And, you know, I kind of is for the fly fishing industry as a whole. um, I look at it as a wonderful thing for for my saving for retirement. It's not such a great thing, but (laughs) no. (laughs) um, Yeah. yeah, uh, It sure is fun. Well, I mean, I I look at it too the same. I mean, I joke about that, but it's true. I mean, I, a lot of the stuff I do is spay now because I definitely do a lot of steelhead, you know, and that's good. But then, yeah, you hear about these people. We've done episodes with people casting off the back of their pickups off into the salt, Yeah, you know, with their spay rods doing like full overhand casts. So you don't even have to have necessarily 
doing the snap tea stuff, there's all sorts of different ways to do it, right? And for, for me anyway, I, I'm, uh, I'm north of 60 now and my, my shoulder from years of chucking a nine or, or 10 weight, nine foot rod are just, uh, it's, it's brutal on the arm and the, uh, you know, a seven weight, uh, kind of switch rod, 11 and a half feet or so Yeah, you, you can do the waterborne casts. Um, you can go Scandi or Skagit. And if I get up on a, a jetty or breakwater or even a dock, um, you can also do overhead, which is a, a really, you know, with say a Skagit head, you can absolutely chuck a fly oh, line. two hands. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So much more leverage than you have just with a single hand. And it wouldn't be as hard. I wonder, could you do that? Like if you're out, you know, just on the boat, like going for like a bonefish, do you think you could kind of use the two handed thing there? I don't know. Um, I get asked that a lot and I've thought about it a lot. I'm not sure that it would be as, as effective as that, you know, Being that quick, you gotta yeah, be seven seconds, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you're dealing with, uh, some shooting line in a big head and to get it out quick. I don't think it's really viable for that. If it was, I'm pretty sure a whole bunch of people would already be doing it. And, um, again, it's kind of a deep, dark hole, but it, but it's great. There's a lot there. And, um, I joke about it when I do my trout spay presentations. It's so, sometimes I'll go down in the evening to practice my cast and, you know, the trout keep hooking and getting, interrupting my, my, uh, casting practice which yep. you know when you we out <laughs> when, when you hook a 16 inch trout you, you get in it as quickly as you can to get it off uh, so you can go back the to practice well that's practice. what they say yeah, that's, that's a problem that's why steelheading gets so good right we kind of joke about that too but it's not always steelheading can be tough so sometimes you are just you're practicing right yeah. but they say you should never try to fish and practice like take your time to practice and then when you're fishing, fish, right? But don't, fish, yeah, yeah, so it's different. Yeah. Um, but you said, so trout spay presentation, I like that where you're going because you can have a presentation. Maybe you can break down your presentation here a little bit so we can get a feel for what you cover there. Sure, sure. Um, but I, I start all of them off really with where, it seems a little weird, but where trout are most of their lives. And, and that's within a foot of the bottom. I shoot a whole ton of underwater footage of trout, which... Um, doesn't appear on my YouTube channel. I kind of save it for presentations and seminars and the like. Uh, but they're so consistently within a foot of the bottom, except, you know, there are times when they're they're feeding higher in the water column, uh, mostly in the warmer months and, and when you got bugs coming off. But, you know, they're down there. They're away from their major predators, most of them birds. It's where the large majority of their food comes from. You know, a stonefly nymph washing off a rock or caddis larva or or even, you know, things like uh, fish eggs, you know, spawn. Um, it doesn't go up in the water column, it stays down there. And um, the other thing is it's easier for them to swim down there. There's generally a current cushion that's not moving so fast. So kind of start off there and go, uh, weird place to start for spay, but with the trout spay, it's very easy to get flies down to the correct depth, where those fish are, where you're not getting constantly hung up on the bottom, because it's very easy to add either weighted uh, tips or say versaliters or polyliters to your spay rig. And particularly with the two-handed rods, but you absolutely with a single hand spay, you can do it. Um, it's just far easier to cast those heavier tips and polyliters uh, with spay style casts as opposed to overhead casts. Yeah. And so you get the depth that way. Um, you know, mo most of the time when we're doing this, not all the time, uh, we're imitating bait fish or or even crayfish uh, when we're doing trout spay. There are times, and I can talk about that when we're imitating insects, but um, those things affect insects and, and say, bait fish, day starters, sculpins. Right. Yeah. They're neutrally buoyant, you know, and they, they as soon as you put weight in a fly, it doesn't behave in a neutrally buoyant manner, okay? So I really like, I, you know, I fish weighted flies with... Um, you know, bead heads, cone heads, uh, lead free wire wraps behind those. I do fish them and do cast them when I'm trout spay fishing, but I would always prefer to have a weightless fly um, taken down to depth where those trout are um, by, say, a poly leader or, you know, a, a sink tip. It just, I think the whole thing behaves more naturally that way. That's how I start off the presentation. First of all, showing where 
where the trout are most of the time, and then talking about the different setups that you can use. And I go through a, a single hand uh, setup, you know, how you'd set up your regular nine, nine foot five weight. And then I go into how you'd maybe um, kind of use that same rig, but like on a four weight, two handed trout spay. Those two are kind of Skagit rigs and um, shorter heads uh, designed for generally larger flies and heavier sink tips. Um, and then the the final one to me, which is what, what I do mostly here in New Jersey, um, is a very light, you know, like a three-weight trout spay rod, kind of a switch rod about, you know, 11 and a half feet long uh, with a Scandi head on it. So kind of a more delicate approach mm -hmm. and not as big and heavy uh, as a Skagit head, uh, more designed for a subtle presentation and smaller flies in not all that deep water. Now here, you know, a deep water here is considered a six, six feet is real deep for New Jersey. And uh, a lot of times it's not fast, fast water in that six feet. So we just don't need big sink tips. And most of our bait fish species here are fairly small, you know, the dace and the darters. And so flies are smaller and can be lighter. And that rig with the with the Scandi head on it and, you know, a lighter poly leader, say an intermediate or a three inch per second, really gets, gets you down to where the fish are, but you can present much, much smaller flies very naturally. And that's where there are a lot of insect species that, that are actually very good swimmers. And um, so we can imitate them. Plus we can also imitate emerging insects you know, with traditional small flies and think like, you know, like North country spiders and wet flies and soft hackles, which are, that's kind of where, that's my really fun stuff right now. That's where I just have the most fun. And uh, it's actually changed kind of my fly tying. And I'm looking back um, in the history, if you will, in, in looking back at those older flies that people fished and that they fished, you know, in, uh, kind of a daisy chain of two, three, even four flies, a brace of flies, if you will. And with a, a light Scandi setup, oh my gosh, is that fun? Just, just, you know, chucking yeah. three flies kind of down and across, maybe a little upstream men. And it's, it's so light and delicate, even in small water, you're not spooking a lot of fish. And the real thing is, and I think anybody who has done either single hand or two handed trout spay will will attest to it's you're you're just swinging and waiting for a grab you know yeah. you can put the rod down at your hip and look around you're you're not staring at a little ball of plastic or a, you know a bright piece of monofilament all day you know there, there there's times for that to do that and you know if if you really want to catch numbers of fish that's the way to go i can't tell you that um, this trout space stuff is going to get huge numbers of fish because it generally doesn't, but it's so much more relaxing and just for me, enjoyable. That's right. No, I hear you. I feel the same way. Yeah. It's kind of like that meditative thing. So you mentioned the, the nine foot five weight. So walk us through a setup. What would that be? So somebody, a lot of people probably have a nine foot five weight. Do they have to go out and get a specific type of Skagit or scanty line for that? What would you recommend? What what I recommend for the the nine foot five weight is um, I I would recommend a short Skagit head something like the well OPST kind of started it off with their Commando head series which are like most of them are like thirteen and a half feet long and um, very very heavy and behind that Skagit head is uh, some type of shooting line it can be like a a bare monofilament like OPST's laser line. Um, you could use something like amnesia that doesn't have a, a lot of memory to it, doesn't get all kinked up, and that really helps with shooting line. And then off that Skagit head, to complete a Skagit setup, you need a, at least uh, a poly leader, preferably a tip to complete that line. And then from that tip, they can be anywhere from 5 to 12 feet in length. You just run straight tip it off of that, you know, uh, one, two, three X tip it off of that. I usually go fluorocarbon for that and then right, right to the fly. Yeah. And so the, the way I look at it, Dave is with a rig like that and you're doing these, you know, waterborne casts mostly with a Skagit rig, you can do touch and go cast, but, uh, mostly waterborne casts. 
And you can also add a haul to it because, you know, you say like me, you have your right hand on the grip and I, I have my left hand on the line. And so at different places during that cast, say a snap T, I can add a little haul in there to energize the whole thing, bend the rod more uh, and, and really put some power into the cast. So super fun to cast with that stuff. Yeah, that is fun. Yeah. And um, you generally need to have a spare spool in order to do that. So if you have, you know, your regular reel with a weight forward line and uh, get a spare spool for that, you really can't change out heads with that setup, if you know what I mean. You, you know, you, you can't put it on the end of your weight, uh, a head like that on the on end. weight forward line or something. Right, right. And to peel off all that weight forward line, you know, 90 feet or whatever, it, it's just not practical. So a spare spool really, really helps out to do that. And you just, you know, if you, you can be, say, dry fly fishing and, and, you know, throughout the morning, maybe switch over to nymphing with your weight forward line and then a little later in the afternoon, maybe just change that spool out, put on a, uh, a Skagit head and other companies other than OPST make them virtually yep. every company makes them now. And they're, they're, um, I have a couple different, um, from airflow and from Rio and all of them work very well. Um, they, you know, range in size from 13 and a half up to like 22 feet for those gadget heads and um, super fun to cast. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, they have a bunch. We were up and we were fishing with uh, Jeff in Ohio. We were using like some of the SA's stuff and it was, uh, I think yeah. they had a new line, but it's the same exact thing. I mean, essentially it's what you're talking about, just a little heavier for steelhead. Now the grain weight is a little bit of confusion there, right? Because the space stuff is kind of measured by grain weight and then the normal single hand lines is kind of five weight, six weight, whatever. How do you pick like the OPST? Is it by grain weight now with the single hand line or how do you know which line to get? Say, let's say you have that five weight. Yeah. And this is what turns a lot of people off and, and, you know, we're into different weights and it's confusing because the weight of a trout spay line isn't like the weight of a, you know, a normal weight forward line. And so Many of the websites, whether they're rod manufacturers or the, the line manufacturers, have charts that you can go by that, you know, if you have, say, I don't know, a, a Douglas Sky G five weight, um, and it will tell you, uh, it'll give you a grain window generally for that rod. And, and, you know, so anywhere from say 200 to 250 grains for that. Yeah. So even on the single handle rods, there will be a grain weight window you can find. Right. And there's differences between the Skagit and the Scandi. And it just, it gets crazy so fast. The best recommendation I can give to anybody out there who's considering this is to, to go through a shop, go through people that know. I mean, at, at a fly shop, you know, they have people in all the time that, that are giving them feedback. They're out there casting this gear and you can save yourself so much time and money by go, you know, going to somebody, listen, I've got this nine foot five weight Scott Radian, let's say, and what would you recommend? Um, and, and lines are different, you know, um, a, uh, a Rio, uh, shooting head is not going to be exactly the same as an OPST, you know, it might be a little bit longer. It might be. And so what setups work well, because there are two things at play here. You can burn a whole lot of money trying to get something that works with the rod that you have. And secondly, if you're just learning it, you can waste a whole lot of time trying to learn how to do these casts, and it may not be you. It might be that your setup isn't correct, and you could think, oh, geez, I'm never going to learn this. I'm, I'm not getting tight loops. I'm not really getting my, my line out there the way I want to. Um, yep. it, it could be you, <laughs> but um, yeah. and it also could be what you have uh, as a setup, and so ideally go through the shop and even better yet have some uh, a spay instructor um go through and and kind of go okay your gear's fine it's that you're you know you're you're moving too fast or um you just putting power on at the wrong spot the, you know that's the ideal thing to do is to to, to have one on one or go to one of the you know spay nation or a spay clave somewhere and and get the instruction that way uh, really, really helps out. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Chode Outdoor, legendary comfort and equipment you can trust. Chode insists on the finest material and craftsmanship to assure you have the highest standards of quality. 
you'll feel in control of the elements in your Chota gear. Every product is solidly backed with a no-nonsense warranty against defects. And I have a family connection to Chota over the years. Back in the shop, uh, the old shop, my dad uh, carried Chota, and he wore those proudly with confidence. And now I'm carrying on that tradition supporting Chota. And I'm very excited about the new products coming out this year and working with Chota in 2023. I'm pretty rough in my gear and find myself putting a lot of miles on that gear and being pretty rough on it. So it's good to know that the Chota gear is durable, is bomber, and I don't have to worry about it. And uh, even on those long trips, you know, if you have a blowout, it's not going to be a good situation. So I'm excited to uh, keep digging into this this year. Clean, comfortable, charismatic, and ready for any situation you can throw at it. You can head over right now to Choda Outdoor at wetflyswing.com slash Choda. That's C-H-O-T-A to support this podcast in a great family company right now. Okay, now back to the show. There's probably some spade claves or something out there in your neck of the woods. I know there's some all over the West and Midwest. Uh, do you find that? I mean, I know steelhead's always been the thing, but are you finding now spade claves are more than just steelhead it's about all these species yeah i mean with the pandemic we really ran into a problem with that because you know just as is trout space seemed to be getting good momentum and, and and kind of spay casting in general pandemic and you know we couldn't get together in large groups and a lot of that seems to be coming back now um i i just got a um a text that it looks like spay nation is coming back to upstate new york oh, the there you go. river awesome and so yeah and it was i mean it was great back in the day but we just lost a few years there and and uh i also heard that there's a big one up in quebec uh this summer uh, i unfortunately i'm going to be away for that i would love to get up um for that and uh yeah and then you know there's smaller groups that get together and give to group spay casting and, and trout spay um clinics and things like that and absolutely worth yeah. it and even like what you're doing like right tim i mean because we're kind of going over something we're, we won't cover everything in this podcast because it's impossible but you have your own kind of probably people can track you down see where you're going to be presenting next on some of this yes absolutely and i you know i do it at the um at the fly fishing shows whether it's it's actually casting on the casting pond or just a video presentation to show these different setups. And I usually bring uh, gear for show and tell when I'm doing that. And so they get to see what I'm actually talking about with poly leaders and tips and heads and the difference between them. And I've also done a few clinics on the river, which have just been a ton of fun for me to do. It's nice to see because you're, you know, I mean, you're known, like we said at the start, you're known for these fly tying, like the way you do your videos are kind of top of the game. But I mean, you're not just doing fly tying. Now you're expanding. Do you feel like the fly tying thing is just one of your things and now you're expanding or have you always kind of done a little bit of the fly fishing with the fly tying on the teaching end? Yeah, quite a bit, you know, especially locally. And then, um, you know, I do presentations on night fishing and now trout spay and uh, what trout like to eat because I, I do have a one of the things I really enjoy is getting footage of trout underwater and bugs on the water or in the water and uh, macro videography is kind of my specialty which comes from the fly tying and so I also have a lot of video of bugs underwater oh, nice. and yeah looking at their coloration and movement and you know profile and everything like that really up close and personal um, in fish tanks so that helps with the fly tying. You know, I, I can pick out things there and incorporate them into my patterns. But you're not giving up the fly tying. You're still going strong. No, no, no. It, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. It's it's a little hard to get videos out, you know, during show season. There's just so much. And uh, I think it might surprise people how um, with the videos that I produce, kind of bare minimum is about seven or eight hours of production time. Oh, wow. Per video? Per we're one like 10 minute video? Yeah. And... I'm a video producer by trade. That's that's I've been doing it for almost 40 years now. And so it's a different kind of production than just say sitting down and and doing a speed tying thing like you see on Instagram or TikTok. Right, and, right. And yeah. th those I mean I, th those have a place. Uh, I I love watching them. They're interesting, but they are different than a a really, you know, produced 
um, tying video the way we do. Yeah, I love it. I love your style too, the way you do the videos, you know, I mean, not only is it the front facing, which is a unique thing, but just how you add, you know, you got the different views, but just the feel of it, it's not slow, but it's like, it's nice and calm and you're getting some history. Maybe you're talking about something, right? So it's not just, yeah, yeah. you bring the whole thing in and it's kind of the way I would love, you know, I think of kind of the way I podcast, I want it to flow like that too, where it's just like, you know, people are just listening having a conversation, you're learning, but you're also maybe digging into some history. Is that, I mean, when you put together your initial fly tying videos, you know, is what we're seeing now kind of what you thought at the beginning or has it evolved over the years? It's kind of like from the beginning. When I decided that I wanted to do it um, as a video producer, I, I and a fly tire, kind of a combination of the two, I had some criteria that, um, and, and I, I can go through it. One is it had to be from the tire's perspective. Um, and, you know, I guess I might have a little right, left dyslexia because when I look at it facing toward the tire, the camera view, I get a little mixed up as to what's going on. So I figured give the viewer that view. Secondly, it really bothered me from early tying videos that I saw that there wasn't materials prep. And to me, materials prep is just as important as tying it onto the hook and um, you know, whether it's keeping the tips on pheasant tail fibers aligned or, um, you know, how do you strip a hackle feather? And so that was another big part of it. I insist if I was going to do these tying videos, I had to, had to have that. The other thing is many of them, you know, are recorded live as somebody's tying and as a video editor, that's really problematic. And so it doesn't allow for editing, uh, to get rid of, dead air or mess ups or, you know, whatever it is. And so, um, all the narration for mine is written and then recorded and then cut up and, you know, goes with the video. So, um, a, a different difference from a lot. And you know, again, something that I insisted on. And then of course, um, you know, filling the frame with the fly. I, I never saw any reason to, you know, have a whole ton of space around the fly. You you need to see it. The closer, the better, right? Like zoom in as far yeah. as you can. Yeah. The only problem with that is so Dave is yeah. that, you know, you're, you're seeing things that even if you have magnification, you wouldn't see, you, you wouldn't see. And right. so, um, I had one the other day and it, it's just one of those, I really had to laugh about it. And I tied a size 24 parachute, called a high vis midge and one of the comments on it was you know great tying video tim but in the end the fly does look a little sloppy yeah <laughs> he he wasn't joking and, and you know and if you're looking at a size 24 on a 65 inch television <laughs> the, you know that it's two feet across but in reality when you look at it it's you know about an eighth of an inch and so it's a little deceiving at times for people that is cool though but that is the whole thing that's the package that separates you from I think most everybody else is that you've been yeah. producing that sort of quality for a while. And yeah, it's good. And you, you know, you've got the connections, right? Like Orvis, that's still a big, um, I mean, how was that? How did that, you know, I'm sure you talked about that in the last one, but you're still affiliated with Orvis, right? Doing some great stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it started a long time ago, gosh, probably 12 years ago now. And uh, Midcurrent's the same way with uh, Marshall Cutchin at Midcurrent. Um, we, they have both Orvis and Midcurrent have been posting our videos for years. I mean, a full decade. And, it, you know, as soon as the video comes out, it goes up on both their, the Orvis fly fishing blog uh, comes out in the Midcurrent newsletter, goes up on their website. So they, they both uh, have been incredible for us in terms of exposure. And then with Orvis, we've done some stuff um, doing, uh, this was actually Tom Rosenbauer's idea way back when, uh, one minute tying tips, which have been extremely popular. Uh, I think we're, we're just over 200 now and it's just one little, you know, technique and you get through it in a minute. It doesn't require sitting down for, you know, a full seven or eight minutes to go through a whole tying video. And I, to me, those tips like that are, they're very digestible, if you will. And yeah. you tend to remember them better if they're just that one little thing. And then, um, I don't know whether you've seen them, but, uh, Tom Rosenbauer and I do <laughs> these tie offs oh, yeah. on the first Monday of every month, which have, we started <laughs> doing it as a pandemic thing, uh, but just because they're just, you couldn't get together, you couldn't do, you know, no fly fishing shows and they have become really popular and, and they're a ton of fun to do. And, uh, Tom and I, uh, do, do a little chirping back and forth. And, uh, 
to me, it's so cool that, you know, we've both been tying for a very long time and we'll, we'll take a pattern, the same pattern, basically the same materials. We tie in entirely different ways and result is almost exactly the same. So it really shows that they're, that they're more, there's just like no way that a fly has to be tied. No. And that's the beauty of it, right? Is that the flies yeah. that are tweaked even a little bit, you know, might make the difference on your specific water, right? If you yeah. customize it. And it all, it also has to do with, you know, where you are in, in terms of tying experience, what materials you, you have, and then just overall preference, you know, how, how, what level of dexterity do yeah, you have? Exactly. Eyesight, right? Eyesight's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And so I hope it suggests to people that, that they can do it, how it's comfortable for them. And that, that there's nothing that's against the law. I always wonder about that. Cause that's what I appreciate about watching your videos that you're really good with, you know, not only, I mean, the dry flies, like the really meticulous, like that's one of my struggles. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a bad person, right? Because I've, I've never enjoyed the dry flies. I've never really nailed it. You know, I've tied some, but it's just one of those things I think I realize. you know what? I don't enjoy doing the dry flies, so I'm not going to tie them. And, you know, it doesn't make me a bad yeah. person because that's the way I am. But you've nailed that, right? I mean, that's something you're good at. Have you always been really good at the, the kind of cat skill stuff and all that small stuff? Well, and and I, I I'm the first one to admit, like uh, with cat skill stuff, as compared to some, I'm a rank beginner. I mean, it, just because of where I live here and the people that have influenced me have all been cat skill style tires. But there are people, I, I mean, some right in the town that I live in that are incredible at it. It's like their area of study. Let, let's let's equate it to science. I I study biology. Those guys, you know, study macro invertebrate insects yeah they're much higher right yeah and so the quality of their work is it's exceptional and and to me things like instagram are so great for showing that showing off that quality and you just go they're they're um gosh the flies are just so elegant and perfect and they're also you know you don't have to do this but they're guys that are tying historically accurate stuff and th this doesn't apply just to cat skill style flies it might be you know the carrie stevens flies from up in Ra rangeley lakes area of maine or flat wings you know for saltwater and they're they're using the the materials that were used you know back when the flies were invented or um, you know they're, they're staying very true to some techniques that um, were, were used during that time period and so their flies at least harken back to that time and, and that's it, it's really neat from a historical perspective that they're carrying those traditions through um, i i'm not <laughs> i'm kind of all over yeah, the place right you cover it all yeah i cover it all and i i love that stuff i um uh but you know i i'm I like tying parachutes as much as I like tying cat skill style. Remind us again on the cat skills. What makes it a cat skill style dry fly versus say just another type of dry fly? Dry fly. It's generally that the the, um, the hackle collar is wound vertically as opposed to um, say parallel to the water surface as in a parachute fly. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it's a broad category. So when you think of dry flies, like your tra traditional whatever fly. Um, blue winged olive or, um, you know, whatever dry fly, if it's tied vertically, then that's pretty much a cat skill style. That has become the meaning of cat skill style flies. But if you're tying true cat skill style flies, there are quite a few other things that they come into play. Probably the biggest one is that the fly sets off the water and uses the tail, the tip of the tail to cause surface tension. Also the bottom of the hook bend that little place where the very bottom of the hook bend contacts the water surface, that should be another point of surface tension to hold the fly up. And then the hackle points um, are the other points of surface content. So the bug rides up with kind of tilted up in the front the way an adult mayfly would. And so the abdomen is actually held off the water and really presents this incredibly realistic uh, view for the trout. They're delicate. And if you really stick into cat skill style flies, you're going to leave some space behind the hook eye, some bare shank behind the hook eye, because back in the day they used a turtle knot uh, to tie their tippet onto the fly. And then you throw in some beautiful, say, uh, split 
uh, wood duck flank wings, and, and they're they're just gorgeous. Yeah, they are gorgeous. <laughs> they, 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 they really are. And, you know, a parachute is a very, very effective fly. There, there's no doubt about it. But they just aren't as elegant as those those true cat skill style flies. Yeah, it is impressive. Nice. So this is good. I'm glad we went down the fly tying track a little bit. We, we didn't want to leave that. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. We got a little, little far away from trout spay. But, Let's circle um, back around because we were talking about just, yeah. you know, we talked about the nine foot. And I wanted to get in the setup because that is, I think, a point of confusion. So you... You talked about that. There's a bunch of different types. You know, the OPST has some stuff. You can get your grain weight even balanced with your single. If we take it to two hand, it sounds like 11 and a half foot is something you use. Is it the same thing there? Is the setup the same? Like you're saying, it's still a Skagit head with a tippet. And are you going to set it up similar to how you set up the single hand rod? Um, yeah, in a way. Um, and with a Skagit head, um, and again, Skagit generally shorter than a Scandi head uh, and intended for bigger flies, bigger water, uh, and heavier sink tips, um, Scandi lighter, generally longer yeah. and, and, and lighter stuff. What's the cutoff there? I know this is probably hard, but if you had to cut off, say, okay, I've got this gadget, which is like the garden hose, big, heavy thing. You turn over big, <laughs> yeah. and then you need heavy sinking lines, but what is the cutoff? When would you go to the Scandi? When do you know? Is it like, is there a certain sink tip you wouldn't cast the gadget with or something like that? Um, Gosh, that's a tough one. And and now now there is um there's kind of a, a merging, if you will, uh, you know, their heads that are halfway between a Skagit and a Scandi. And they can they can handle tips and they can also handle poly leaders. And generally poly leaders go with Scandies, poly inverse leaders, and tips go with Skagit. But they they have um I, I think every manufacturer is making them now, these kind of hybrids between Skagit and Scandi. Um, which you can sort of do both with, um, but you know every everything is in fly fishing is a compromise, and 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 so those you know they they have drawback. They don't do either just as well as say a Scandi would you know do the job or a, a true Skagit. Gotcha. Oh well, let's let's take it to this. Let's take it to your your setup. So it sounds like you have a like a eleven and a half foot spay two handed rod. Is that something? Yeah. Or what is your two hand rod that you would fish for trout if you're swinging, say, normal stuff out there in your area? I'm kind of looking at the rod rack right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's grown a little bit, Dave. <laughs> over the yeah. Years what's it look so... like? Des describe that rod rack. Is it does it have more spay rods or more single handed rods? It's uh, wow. It, it's about a fifty fifty split. No kidding. There you go. So you're fully into it. Yeah, we we just we're not going to let Joan know this, okay? right? It's just between us. Yeah, um, yeah. So I am, in terms of the trout spay, I do have a two, a three, a four, and a five. Oh wow, you got the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm working on another five weight. And uh, so anyway, and some of them I have uh, a Skagit set up on them, and I, like I have a ten foot Douglas DXF. Uh, our 10 and a half foot DXF and it's a four weight. Um, I have kind of a Skagit set up on that for a little bit deeper water that we get around here. Uh, maybe, you know, spring runoff, uh, faster water, faster and deeper. And so I want some heavier stuff on that. Then I have a little Orvis clear water. Uh, it's, I think it's 11, two, three weight. That was kind of an interesting one. I got it, bought it as a kit, which is another way to get around this whole thing of figuring stuff out, Orvis has tested that nine ways to Sunday, and and they have they have the reel that balances it. They have the line that's going to work with that particular rod, and packaged all together, it's a really great value. So um, you have that, and then uh, little two weight. Uh, again, my rods are all over the place. Two weight Reddington hydrogen, which you can't get anymore. They're no longer making the hydrogen, but it's just this with a little like 180 grain Scandi line on it. It's, uh, I think, 11 foot rod. And in that two weight category, everything is very, very light in the hand. And it's unbelievable for chucking little soft tackles and wet flies and things like that. Super, super fun, uh, you know, particularly as we get in the warmer months. And yeah, it, you know, each each has its own own merits. The five weight, I have both a, uh, a Skagit head and a Scandi head for it. Um, I, I probably should talk about that. There, um, there are integrated lines now where the running line is directly connected to the head, mm, um, yeah. and w which is interesting. It's nice. There isn't that clunk clunk on a loop to loop connection between the, the shooting line or the running line, if you will, and the head, which is really very nice. 
Uh, but at the same time, you can't easily change the heads out. And, and so I'm kind of back to more component where if I have a just running line, standard thin, thin running line or shooting line, I can, with a loop to loop connection, yeah, pop it on. Uh, yeah, pop off the Skagit head and put on a Scandi head yeah. and off to the races. Um, and the other thing that I found is that all that, that clunk, clunk going through the guides kind of stinks. Uh, at nighttime, it's really helpful to tell, <laughs> tell when are. the, yeah, where you are on the line. So you know that the head is completely out of the rod tip and, and you're ready to cast. Uh, so, the, you know, there are merits to both. And, uh, you know, if you have an integrated line and somebody steps on that running line and parts it, you know, with a cleat or whatever, the, the whole thing shot. Whereas, you know, if it was a component system, you could just replace the shooting line and go from yeah, there. Uh, perfect. So you got, yeah, you have it covered. You got a bunch of the, yeah, it sounds like between 10 and a half foot, 11, you know, yeah. are there in the, you said there are some that get 13 and a half, but for the most part, it seems like the lighter stuff, the smaller, shorter is where you would go with trout spade. I mean, what, when would you think you would go for say a longer 13 and a half foot trout? Is that like bigger water? A trout like spade? Yeah. Yeah. Bigger water generally. And uh longer cast. I, I um, had the opportunity. I went to Iceland this year and um, in that situation, we were fishing for big, I mean, big sea run trout. So a five to six weight trout space kind of ideal. And there I, I was fishing with a, like an 11 four. And because, you know, you're knee to waist deep in water, it's wide open. It's this huge estuary where we were fishing. And somebody else that I was there with had uh, like a six weight 13 six and that extra length you know, a, a difference of two feet was tremendous in terms of casting for me anyway. I'm not a tall guy and just that extra bit of height and leverage. And, you, you know, you're, you're adding, uh, gosh, a good 10 yards to the cast. Um, and with the wind and everything, it was really nice. But then again, you know, navigating uh, trees and bushes and stream banks uh, around here in New Jersey on small rivers, the 13.6 the is actually a disadvantage, you know. That way, even something like a, a 10 6 is, is real nice and compact and easy to get around with. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. Charleston, South Carolina native Ethan Eigelhart was bitten by the fly fishing bug in 2014 and shortly thereafter started Stonefly Nets. He now lives in the trout-rich waters of the Ozarks and handcrafts some of the sweetest wooden landing nets you'll see. I've been using these stonefly nets for quite a while now, and I'm excited to dig into another year. Ethan builds these nets custom, and you can select from four sizes and many different wood options. For Ethan, fly fishing is a memory created from a morning on a beautiful stretch of water casting a three-weight bamboo rod that his grandmother gave to his father, and then he passed to Ethan. Ethan is helping us create the same types of lasting memories every time we're on the water with these classic custom wood nets. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to check out your custom net right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to stonefly. Okay, back to the show. So we have the gear a little bit. We have kind of some setups. We talked about that. Maybe the Scandi is another thing we could dig into. Let's talk flies. You mentioned at the beginning about the types of flies. So what are you doing up there? Maybe give us a list of flies that you might use for trout spay. And may I, in your area, are you using the smaller wet flies and some bigger streamers? Or how does that look? Yeah, I, it's it's kind of all over the place, Dave, to be honest with you. And um, if you wanted to keep it simple seriously just a beadhead woolly bugger is perfect you know olive black brown whatever you're used to with that single hand um, and you can cast it single hand spay or the two hand um, that that's perfectly suitable again though i do like weightless flies and so a weightless woolly bugger um, i have a couple patterns up that um, that have a uh, pine squirrel back on them, almost like a zonker. So the the that pine squirrel zonker strip becomes the tail of the fly as well as the back of the fly, and then kind of has a woolly bugger like body to it. So some kind of body around the hook shank, say a chenille, uh, and then uh, hackle pommered over top of that chenille. And I have one that's called the squirrel and hurl bugger, which has been around forever, and a very similar one that I recently posted called a um, an Adams bugger 
which incorporates both um, grizzly and brown uh, saddle hackle. And what I was figuring it was, you know, an Adams size 16 Adams dry fly works so, so well. It's kind of a universal dry fly. And I believe it's because of the mix of brown and grizzly that really, really sets it apart. So incorporated brown and grizzly into this parachute bugger and it on the swing, you know, it's just been absolutely phenomenal uh, for the last eight months or so. And, and the, the fly works real well, but I do go bigger. Um, I have some weighted stuff and, you know, again, to me, what's, it's another thing that I can do. And so a lot of the, you go from spay into trout spay, but it's pulling ideas from, um, you know, intruders used for salmon and steelhead, pulling elements from that, downsizing it, just like we downsize the rods and the rigs. And then, you know, uh, cut shanks, which where you, you use a shank or you, you cut off the bend uh, of a hook and just use the shank and then you you say you have uh, some intruder wire or maybe some power pro braid that goes back to a smaller hook trailing hook and so you get the length and you get that the the business end of the hook way way back on the fly um, which, which is good you know fix those tail biters <laughs> they get a mouthful of iron when they uh, do the tail bite routine uh, you know, long shank hooks to me uh, give the fish a real advantage. Um, they're easily pulled out. And so if you have a nice small, like size eight or 10 uh, Gamagatsu octopus trailing way back there, um, right back at the tail of whatever it is, gosh, it's, I mean, it, it keeps those fish buttoned on there real, real well. And so I'm actually working on a um, series of flies now uh, to hopefully get into falling mill. They, they carry my flies. Um, you know, they're tied commercially through them, uh, some of my patterns, and uh, it's weighted, it has a cone head, but with the, these swung flies like that, I like it to have like four things, and it needs to have, um, needs to have that trailing hook, I really like that, yep. it needs to push water um, to let its presence be known to the fish, um, and so a, a fairly decent head on it, something that pushes water, um, it has to have fine dark markings, which hmm. is kind of, yeah, this comes from looking at, at bait fish in um, aquatic macro invertebrates underwater. Like where, counter coloration sort of stuff. Yeah, bar barring, yeah, uh, barring vermiculations. Right. Um, and so everything living, everything that's protein just about has these fine dark markings in them. And as small as they are, I just absolutely believe that trout recognize it as something living, something protein, and it's something that's of nutritional value. So whether it's um, I'm imitating a, a bug or a bait fish, I try to incorporate fine dark markings. So, um, and then it has also has to have movement, it has to have movement and as many types of movement as you can. And so for instance, like to get both barring and movement into the fly, maybe rubber legs, barred rubber legs or silly legs, um, the other thing is when I watch bait fish underwater in my fish tanks, they're always flashing. Even as dull as, say, a sculpin is, um, there's a little bit of flash in their scales, some iridescent, so a little flash. So push pushes water, find dark markings, movement, and a little bit of flash. So five, so that's a bonus one, right? So flash gives you a fifth on the... Yeah, it is that a fifth? I think so. <laughs> yeah. so we're getting a bonus, yeah. so yeah. so this is going to be the bonus <laughs> okay. on this on this podcast. <laughs> so that, that that's what I'm trying to add into all my trout space streamers at, at this point is are, are those five now five elements, and uh, to me that's what attracts the fish, and then you tie them in different colors to attract the fishermen, <laughs> the anglers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love the pushing the water. Yeah, when we were doing some of the steelhead stuff. Um, Oh, what was it called? One of the guides that we were down there with used some of, um, I think it was Blaine Chocolate's tubing. I can't remember exactly what it, but he puts this, okay. yeah, yep. it's this, it's this tubing stuff. And they were putting this underneath the hackle essentially. And I can't remember the name, but anyways, it was just, it worked. I mean, literally he gave me yeah. one of those flies. I went out and caught a couple of fish on it. So yeah, it's that pushing. It's like doing something different. So the fly isn't just laying down like a noodle in the water. You want it breathing, right? Right. You want it breathing and pushing water and uh, you know, I, I believe anyway that the trout can sense that probably using the lateral lines more than anything that, 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 that push of water underwater on the water surface really is attractive to them. And so, you know, if I'm putting in, say for instance, a, um, 
a rabbit fur collar. I'll have something behind it that props that rabbit fur up just a bit so it doesn't sweep all the way back along the body of the fly and go go ultra flat, which is kind of the idea of intruders, um, you know, back, the true intruder from back in the day was just to, to have it be a, a big presence, the, you know, having those fibers stick stick out quite a bit so it pushes water. That's it, right on, right. And I think fun, it's, fun stuff too. I, I mean, Dave, it's it's yeah. just like this whole world I opens know. up, and and you start messing with the stuff and and pulling ideas from all from salt water, from from salmon and steelhead, and, and then downsizing it to trout, and you know, it's really a whole other series of flies that you can tie and fish. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And I just looking at it, it's, it's I think it's called the body uh, Blaine's body tubing. Body tubing, yeah, okay. And, yeah. uh, I think a bunch of people fly them in. Lots of people have that stuff out there. So yeah. anyways, but cool. Well, we, so we touched on the flies, so we got that. What else are we missing? I know we haven't hit deep, but if we go back to your presentation, as we start to think about taking this out of there, what else do you want to leave somebody with if you think about, you know, okay, they got the rod, that's easy. Even the woolly, I love that you said the woolly bugger because now they can just yep. go and grab the woolly bugger. Um, what else should they be thinking about before they get on the on the water? Well, one of the things that can seem like, and it was for me, is is like extremely overwhelming. When you go to, say, YouTube and you start looking at spay casting, particularly the two-handed stuff, you know, single-hand casting, mo most of them are doing like snap tees or maybe um, a snake roll here and there or just a single spay or a double spay. But even right there, that's a whole lot of different casts. And you go, well, why in the world are the casts that complicated moving all over the place and when you start to break them down it really isn't that complicated and the reason you need them is is mainly has to do with the way the current is flowing and which side of the river you're on and probably most importantly how the wind is blowing and so let, let's talk about it as a roll cast for so for people that don't really know spay casting when you roll cast you don't want to have that D loop that you form um, upwind of you. Because when you make that forward cast, the wind is very likely to push your fly line down on top of you along with the hook, okay? Um, and so just think of that. It's the same thing with spay casts. You do not want to have that D loop um, that forms kind of that, that abbreviated back cast, if you will you don't want it on the upwind side. And so they're different casts. So no matter what side of the river you're on, which way the current is flowing, you can keep that D loop on the downwind side of you. Um, this changes from river right to river left. And it gets, it gets kind of complicated, but in the end you'll figure it out. And that's why there's so many casts. Um, and then they're, they're kind of different styles. They're, they're waterborne casts and which lend themselves to Skagit lines, and then their touch-and-go casts, which are more Scandi line-oriented, very just a light touch on the water surface, and then it's gone. And so that's why all the different casts, it, it, it'll take you a while to, if you're just starting out to sort them all out, but it really isn't that difficult in the end. And that there is good reason for it. It isn't just people making up casts. Yeah, exactly. The wind is a big part. Where do you think... Yep. Um, you know, obviously like a fly shop would be a good place to go into, maybe get a lesson. What else do you write? If somebody wanted to dig in deeper on casting, is there something where they can kind of look at YouTube videos or another resource you'd recommend? Yeah, YouTube is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, there, there's some DVDs out. You can do that. But, you know, YouTube is for the most part free. And uh, there, there are some great, fabulous instructors there. And I, I'm, I know I'm going to name a few or miss some here, but like um, Klaus Freemore, <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Yeah, definitely. Um, Klaus is awesome. And uh, uh, he's he does these Scandi casts and um, re really is not very fond of Skagit casting. And so he's fun to watch. Simon Gosworth, of course, uh, one of the best instructors ever, just clear and to the point. Um, oh, my gosh. Topher Brown oh, uh, Topher, has got right. a few. Yeah, Topher is um, an amazing instructor. Um, and John Hazlitt is another one. And again, I apologize for who I'm missing. I watched all these guys, but, um, YouTube tremendous resource for it. And they break it down. I mean, they'll, they'll go in depth on a snake roll, for example. Um, and then, you know, talk about gear and spay cast regular fly casting is a very dynamic thing. And 
you know, back in the day, I learned from books and magazines and little diagrams with candy cane loops in one o'clock and two o'clock and four o'clock. And so when, when you see it in, you know, full 4K, 120 frame per second slow motion, you can really, really get the idea of what people are doing. And it's movement in three dimensions, not just two, um, you know, regular overhead casting. Yes, that's three-dimensional, but not as three-dimensional as, say, a spay cast. And so you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on. And video, especially slow motion video, is really beneficial to learning and to teaching. Nice. So yeah, I'll put some links out to some of the people we talked about. I think uh, Klaus we had on 127 and definitely Topher. Those are definitely all good connections. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think uh, we did a good job kind of, uh, you know, with a primer on this. We might have to circle back around with you at a later point and, uh, you know, cover some more. Exa- and it is it is a lot. You know, you can go as deep as you want. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. It's it's all fun. Um, you know, for me, it's pretty new. And uh, I certainly wasn't bored yeah. with fly fishing. I, I don't want anybody to come away with that impression, but it's just like, it's this new thing that, you know, new, new life and new opportunities. And, uh, you know, we, we incorporate it with some travel and, you know, that, yeah, you're starting to find destinations that are suitable for trout spay. I hear you. you know, I've, I've been, uh, had a, a John Gearock book. Um, I would, I'm trying to think of the one, but man, that guy, he's so good at describing just what we're talking about, the traveling around and the stories. And he does spay, yeah. right? He does some steelhead fishing. He loves yeah. it. Even though yeah. he's a big trout guy, he's been bitten by it too. And it's not just steelhead, but I think it is just trying something new and, you know, another test, right? It's or not a test, but another, another challenge. You never yeah. want to get, yeah. yeah, I get tired of stuff. So, well, and remind us again as we take it out of here. So your your course, if somebody was to find this or look you up either online or at one of your events, what else are you going to cover there on these courses? Are you going to go deep into like just techniques and stuff like that and other pieces of the trout spay? Yeah. What I'm doing now is uh, I, I can teach the basics of spay casting, trout spay, uh, but I will not go into detail on that. There are people who are much better versed at it than I am. So you know, whether it's on the river or online or, um, you know, in person, it's much more kind of like we covered here. And I like to do a show and tell. In other words, what I bring on the river with me when I'm trout spay fishing, um, you know, what gear I bring, I try to keep it to a minimum. Um, and what, what I actually, what I look for, how I practice things like that. That's what I'm bringing to the table in these presentations. Um, and, uh, in terms of spay casting, I'm still learning. Um, and I'm not to the point yet where I want to teach somebody how to spay cast. I'm still taking lessons myself. In fact, I have, uh, um, do you know who Whitney Gould is? Have yeah. You? Yeah. She's the yeah. champion, <laughs> right? The, the yeah. yeah. Champion. <laughs> and so my wonderful wife, uh, for Christmas, best Christmas present I think I've ever got. She, she has given me, um, when I'm out in California at the Pleasanton show, um, I have a, a lesson with Whitney at Spay Lesson at with Whitney at Golden Gate Casting. Oh wow! Club, uh, and so it's covering uh, a multitude of things for me. I've been watching video from Golden Gate and reading stories for years, and and uh, I know Whitney from the shows. And it, it's one of these things where I'm kind of I'm really excited about it, but I'm also nervous at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got that I'm going to be casting at Golden Gate. Uh, and Whitney Gould is going to be critiquing my cast and, and hopefully helping me along. That's amazing. Yeah. Al- always learning, you know, and, and that's, that's a huge fun part of it for me. How far is that? How far is the Golden Gate Casting Club from, um, from, from Pleasanton? Yeah. It's right there, right? San Francisco. Right? It's just like an hour or so away. Yeah. And an hour it's, uh, I think it's the San Mateo bridge. You have to get over, which, oh. you know, across the bay. Yeah. yeah. Which can be a little, little hairy. Um, at rush hour, but, um, we have an extra day and, and, um, and I got a couple presentations out that way. I, in fact, a trout spay presentation where, you know, I have video shows the setups that we were talking about and, uh, but yeah, pretty much everything we were talking about. And then I'll do a little show and tell at the end. And, uh, uh I think people have found value in it so far. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Nice. Well, 
I think we're going to get this one uh, is going to go live, uh, hopefully before the Pleasanton show. So maybe we'll oh, good, yeah, give, good. give people a heads up that you're going to yeah. be there and then people can connect with you there. Nice. Super. All right, Tim. Well, I think, um, well, let's take it out here. We got the two minute drill. I've, I've been working on the two minute drill, trying to force us to, to wrap it up here. So we got, I got a couple of little rapid fire questions for you. These will be easy. Okay, um, go well, ahead. Let's do this. I'm going to start the timer. Uh, make sure we stick uh, within the two minutes if we can. All right, here we go. So let's do, so we've been talking rods. So we're talking single head, everything. You got one rod to pick. What is it for the rest of your days? Single hand, nine foot five weight. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, one fly for the rest of time. Oh gosh. I'm going to go with the squirrel and hurl bugger um, in terms of just productivity um, all around. Can't beat it. Okay. And we've been talking spade today, trout spade. Give us another, give us one tip that would be something somebody could take away from today. It could be anything casting or flies or anything that pops up. Uh, gosh, the, the, the biggest one is to, to get coaching from an expert in terms of equipment, casting, everything. Um, yeah, benefit from their experience. Yep, perfect. And, uh, and what's your one trip? So you've been doing some stuff. What if you had your one trip you can do that you haven't done yet? What do you want? New Zealand, without a doubt. There you go, New Zealand. Okay, and then uh, do you have a local fly? What, what's the closest fly shop to you? I don't know if you have a local shop there. Uh, we do, and I, I guide through them. Uh, I do do tying classes with them. It was um, formerly called Shannon's Fly and Tackle. It's been in business since 1970, and um, unfortunately, um, one of the owners of Shannon's passed away this year at the ripe old age of 55. Uh, he was a very, very good friend, and and uh, it was just horrible all the way around. But the good news is, is that um, the fly shop has been taken over by a young young couple. They purchased it, and um, they've kind of had a soft opening back in December. Uh, they will be open completely with guiding and everything like that. I'll be guiding with them um, starting about mid-April. They they were unable to keep the name Shannon's, which is known, you know, kind of far and wide. And um, but just for legal and financial reasons, uh, it's now South Branch Outfitters, and uh, it looks to be a great shop, just as the old Shannon's was. Perfect. All right, Tim. Well, we'll send everybody out to uh, tightlinesproductions.com. Uh, com, and uh, yeah, just want to thank you again for another great episode. We're excited to keep in touch with you here and everything else you have going. So yeah, thanks again for all the time today. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. That that was fun. So there it is, wetflyswing.com slash 430, 430. Uh, you can get some show notes, get some links, and I'm sure there's going to be a couple of Tim Flagler fly tying videos. You can get that view of his fly tying angle from the front side. Check it out right now. And also, uh, you're going to see a link to the Stillwater School, uh, wetflyswing.com slash trips. Right now, we've got a few slots left. If you're interested in heading up to a remote wilderness area to one of the coolest lodges you're going to find anywhere uh, and a chance at some great big rainbows, this is the trip for you. We actually have early bird pricing still right now. This is $400 off this trip and it's going to end, I think, in about 10 days. So this is your shot. The window is going to be closing. You can check it out right now. Okay, where are we heading next? Let's take a look. Let's take a quick peek and see where we are heading next. Okay, uh, this week we got some bonus episodes this week. Uh, tomorrow we're heading out. We're going to hear from uh, Choda, uh, Choda Outdoor Gear. This is a good one, Caleb and Mark. This is a very fun episode. You, you don't want to miss that one tomorrow. Thursday, uh, we got a big surprise. We got uh, Brendan Morrison, uh, NHL hockey player. And we hear his story, also Real West Coast host. Check that out. And then I got a really giant surprise for you on Friday. On Friday, the Great Lakes Dude is here. The Great Lakes Dude podcast finally is here. Jeff Liske is going to be here to give us his intro on the very first podcast, a Great Lakes podcast. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, Jeff's going to give us a really cool intro to the Great Lakes he is our man, and uh, and he is going to break it out on Friday this week. A uh, very big week. Uh, I think we're getting very close to uh, every day of the week, and, uh, and we're going to keep working on it. Hope to uh, connect with you, maybe see you on the water, maybe see you online, and I hope you are having a great evening, great morning, or a great afternoon wherever in the world you are, and I appreciate you for checking in and stopping by today.
Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.